we have Rory Metcalf from the Australian National University who's just written a new book called Contest for the Indo-Pacific, Why China Won't Map the Future. And we have, uh, in conversation with him, we have Cleo Pascal of Chatham House. Cleo has just uh, completed a almost eight month long uh, study of the Indo-Pacific from different locations, which will be published uh, in the next few months. So we have two very interesting and uh, uh, knowledgeable people on the subject. Uh, I leave them to be in conversation with each other and then we will open it up after 15 minutes for questions and answers. So you can put it in your chat or you can just raise your hands um, and let's go for it. Cleo and Rory, welcome. We really value your being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Rory, do you want to start with telling us a bit about your book? Yeah, look, thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to, um, to join you all. Uh, I, was, I was commenting that it's about 12 or 13 hours ago, I was talking about my book virtually in the United States, and now I'm doing it in India. So I feel like I've crossed the Indo-Pacific uh, in a single day. Uh, but look, the, the book, which um, I've got a copy here just to share with uh, everyone, uh, Indo-Pacific Empire is the title of the international edition. And in fact, uh, the Australian edition, same book, different name, Contest for the Indo-Pacific, um, is an attempt to really try and explain how the region has got to the situation it's in, not obviously with the the current crisis of the pandemic, which is going to really shake a lot of these regional structures, but to tell a story of the past 20 to 30 years uh, as to how we've found ourselves in an Indo-Pacific strategic system, uh, which of course is somewhat different uh, to the, the Asia-Pacific idea that, that dominated the late 20th century. And the book is really, uh, it's not intended as an academic exercise. It's not just a history lesson, if you like, but it takes these changing mental maps of the region that brings, uh, I guess, India's uh, part of the region, uh, India, the Indian Ocean, South, a uh, South Asia, much more into, I guess, the, the mainstream of the, the regional strategic story and explains that with particularly the rise of China, the extension of China's interests and presence and influence, and frankly, the disruption of China's power across the Indian Ocean into, I guess, India's uh, traditional, traditional uh, zone of influence, we're going to have a much more multipolar power play in the region going forward. And so the book tells the story of, of how really all along, this was a, a two ocean region. A lot of the old connectivity that we've often forgotten about, the, the pre-modern connectivity, the influence of, of particularly uh, Indian civilizations into Southeast Asia and East Asia, the, uh, the journey of Islam across the region, China's own forays into the Indian Ocean in the 1400s. And then of course, the, um, uh, the great impact uh, of the European powers of colonialism and, of course, resistance to colonialism, all of this occurred across this two ocean system. And it was only this brief window of the late 20th century where, if you like, um, India and India's worldview was somewhat removed from the way that others in the region, Australia, Southeast Asia, China, uh, and so forth, were, were competing, were engaging. The big narrative is that the Indo-Pacific is back. It's back partly because of India's rise, partly because powers like the United States are building their relationships across this wider region, but in large part because of the, the grand power play uh, that China is making. The Belt and Road, uh, China's expanding military footprint. And I guess to conclude, uh, the to conclude the book, having introduced this, um, this historical narrative, set this scene as to why many of the drivers of trade and commerce and energy, infrastructure, military, diplomacy and so forth, are now uh, functioning in a kind of um, highly connected Indo-Pacific region, we actually have a framework that powers like India and Australia and many others, and I'd note especially Japan, uh, Indonesia, the United States, of course, but the many powers, uh, not only the US and China, but all of the rest of us 
can have much greater agency in this multipolar Indo-Pacific to build networks, to build partnerships, to try to moderate Chinese power and find a, a settling point for our, our prosperity and our security in the years ahead. Now, the book was uh, completed and went to print just before the COVID calamity struck. I do talk a little bit about uh, black swan events and the crises such as pandemics that could, I guess, travel through the, uh, the connectivity of the region to have these really disruptive cascading consequences. But I would argue, and maybe we'll come to that in the conversation, that the strategic implications of what is happening to all of our countries now through the pandemic crisis and the international response will actually accelerate some of the trends that I think over time will help us set limits to Chinese power, help us build a multipolar system in the Indo-Pacific. I hope um, I've opened some conversation there and I'm really interested, Cleo and colleagues, to hear a bit about some of the, uh, the parallel ideas that are now circulating and this particular idea of an Indo-Pacific charter that um, has had prominence recently in a couple of opinion pieces, both in India and in Japan. I'm a bit intrigued as to where that's coming from and I guess what the intent is in this, um, in, in this really volatile strategic environment. Uh, thanks, Rory. That was, that was very interesting. Uh, yeah, it's, it's this issue of framework is, uh, is kind of key and I think that's where the Indo-Pacific Charter idea came from. Um, I was lucky enough to, to work with Gateway House a little bit at the end of last year, um, looking at perceptions of strategic shifts going forward in the Indo-Pacific. And, uh, and, and one of the issues that came up among Indian strategists quite a bit was, okay, well, we, we've got the word, but it's extremely fuzzy and we don't really quite know what it means and we don't quite know how to build on it. And we, we know what we don't want in terms of looking like, you know, uh, this is a military construct designed to uh, go after one specific country and we wanna bring in more people. So how can we conceptualize it in a way that, um, that creates such a strong alliance we can avoid a war as opposed to prepare just militarily for going to war and in that context uh, i think there was a looking back at what what happened or the attempts what was to create an, an alliance of uh an, of ways of looking at the world around 1941 particularly between uh, churchill and uh and what was going on with the US, because of course the US had not joined the war uh, until Pearl Harbor. So uh, this meeting between Roosevelt and Churchill in 1941 in Newfoundland, where they put together this, this Atlantic Charter statement saying, this is what we want the world to look like as we come out of war. And if we can be strong enough together, uh, we can make sure that we're all working in the same direction. And the current uh, proposal for this Indo-Pacific Charter is very similar. It's saying, okay, these are the sort of things that, that we want. This, it has come predominantly out of the Indian strategic community. I've, I've read it. Uh, Professor uh, Nalapat has written about it a few times. I've seen it on NewsX. J Japan has picked it up. And it has some elements like, uh, for example, there's, there's nine points that I've seen floating around, uh, things like, you know, participants work together to promote democracy and participatory government. Nations that are democracies stay democracies. So that is basically saying Taiwan, we're going, what we want to do is, you know, make sure that Taiwan doesn't drift into a, a Chinese orbit. Uh, I don't know what they're gonna do about Hong Kong in that context, but also new, new world issues, like for example, sovereignty of data is also one of the points. So that your data isn't being controlled by servers in China, or in this case, you know, uh, servers in, in other countries that might be uh, not conducive to creating a secure strategic environment. Also the formation of a space security council. So things, ideas that can, can bind countries together in a strategic sense um, to make sure that everybody's working towards a common goal. And, and within those points, it becomes very clear to see which country is the outlier on a lot of this. And it gives you a, a, a framework, as you were talking about, for trying to build common understanding um, that is strong enough to build on to the Quad as just a military 
uh, construct. So you can have a quad plus with an Indo-Pacific charter um, sign-on component to it. Um, so I think what it is, is the beginning of starting to think about, okay, we've got the term Indo-Pacific. We don't necessarily all agree to what it means, but are there some elements, ideological elements behind it uh, beyond just free and open Indo-Pacific that we can work towards building uh, more concrete agreements around that shows who the outliers are and lets us combine to isolate the outliers in areas that we think are not conducive to security and prosperity in the region. Can I respond to that? Because I think that's a really, course, it's yeah. a really intriguing proposal. And, and I, would, I would argue that, look, it's, I guess to be a little bit provocative there, I think it's, it, it, it's intriguing, but it's it, it's too ambitious, I suspect, uh, to have uh, a real prospect of flying at the moment. I think that makes it, though, quite an exciting idea to to raise in the second track and to to begin, I guess, seeking feedback and views on. With my own take on, I guess, trying to institutionalise or give structure or I guess almost a, a normative purpose to the Indo-Pacific in this way is that um, the Indo-Pacific operates on two levels. At one level, and this is I guess essentially related to the thesis of my book, at one level it is essentially a, a, a description, it's an objective uh, depiction of the strategic and the geoeconomic system in which we're now operating in this region. In particular, it's the context in which China is rising, in which China is exhibiting almost, I would say, al almost imperial impulses uh, in some of its behaviour and some of the risk that it's taking on for itself over time. And in that sense, the Indo-Pacific doesn't have a kind of normative function. It's just a, a mental map. It's just a description. At another level, though, uh, I think you're right, or the, the, some of the thinking behind the Charter is... is um, is useful because the Indo-Pacific does create a much larger canvas of powers, of potential partners, of somewhat empowered middle players, a, a larger set of options for countries like India, Australia and others to work with. Not, not all of us democracies, I think Vietnam is one of the countries uh, that's in my mind here, but, but mostly democracies and mostly maritime democracies. And when you look at the, um, the fairly embryonic attempts over the past few years to give articulation to this, to some of the, the normative statements that have been made, and I'm thinking, obviously, the, the principles and statements behind the free and, Indo, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific uh, strategies of Japan and the United States, I'm thinking, for example, Prime Minister Modi's speech in Singapore uh, a few years ago, which I think was a very, a very strong articulation of an Indian Indo-Pacific. Uh, the statements that the Australian government has put out, of course, uh, Australia was, as my book identifies, the, the first country to formally define its region of strategic interest as the Indo-Pacific. And interestingly, the work that Indonesia has led within the ASEANs, within the Southeast Asians, when you start to look for the commonalities across all of these Indo-Pacific visions, those commonalities are there. A lot of the critics say, well, just because countries don't agree on all of the specifics, therefore there's, there's no solidarity. Well, in fact, quite a few of the principles and values that these, um, these efforts to identify an Indo-Pacific charter point out, such as the rights and interests of smaller states, the non-use of coercion in regional affairs, uh, respect for international law and so forth. Uh, a lot of this is in fact common across the very many Indo-Pacific visions of the region. Whether we need to go further at the moment is a different question. And in fact, in some ways would be um, perhaps more, uh, more challenging for China and more challenging for, other, for countries to sign on to particularly as I note in some of the writings on an Indo-Pacific Charter, there's the idea that it would involve almost a commitment to um, act in the common good or a commitment to come to the assistance of those countries that are experiencing 
coercion or military pressure, uh, for example, that's going to be a very big ask to make of many countries in the region, that idea of taking on risk for countries that are not, at this stage, formal treaty allies. And I think in some ways, it was more, um, I guess, natural that that kind of commitment would emerge during wartime, during a crisis such as 1941. Um, it's uh, we're not quite there yet, thankfully, in the Indo-Pacific, and therefore I think it's going to be harder at this stage to advance this idea, but it is an idea that is certainly worth keeping in the, uh, in the arsenal, in the diplomatic arsenal, um, as particularly as Chinese assertiveness continues to, um, to grow. Uh, we've already developed the quad, partly, I would say, as a result of China's choices. If China makes more of the wrong choices in the future, maybe uh, the charter idea is a sign of, of things to come. That's, I guess, how I would, how I would see it, Cleo. Yeah, no, it, and it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, the, 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 okay, what if you breach the charter is the big question, right? I mean, you know, you're, you're gonna, you can't, are you committing to assemble a flotilla or something like that? I mean, that, that's going to be the problematic component of it. But for, on a, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but on a, on a diplomatic front, you know, both uh, Australia and India at the moment are are bearing the brunt of very different sorts of Chinese aggression. You know, with the with the trade issues going on with Australia over WHO, which which and India is backing Australia on its position, and uh, India with the border issue with China, uh, which is at least getting some support. Uh, India is getting a bit of at least acknowledgement from the U.S. that this is a problem. The question is, you know, whether at least initially diplomatically, there can be some uh, acknowledgement that uh, we're going to back each other up. Mm. You know, they might, these might, these, these might not look like war. China's very good at staying under the threshold. But if you start looking around the region to see what they've done with the Malaysians recently and the Vietnamese and the Japanese, you can see on kind of just about every front, they're pushing pretty hard. And they get, and, and China gets a lot of traction because it looks like they're all separate. Mm. Right. So, and everybody's dealing with them one on one. So, if there is a, you know, at least a kind of diplomatic acknowledgement that uh, we, this group of countries, won't stand for, or but but but, but you're completely right. If you won't stand for it, then what do you do after they do it? Uh, but at least a, sort of a that grouping says this is not correct behavior. We don't like this, and gives more publicity and uh, and discussion to these issues as a comprehensive set of actions coming out of Beijing that mm -hmm. is affecting all of the neighbors and destabilizing the neighborhood, then maybe that would be helpful for uh, coalescing a bit of uh, pushback and creating targeted responses uh, where you can figure out Australia is not going to send troops to the Indian border to help with China, but maybe at least in the UN or diplomatically other places, it can help with those discussions. Similarly, you know, maybe India can help with purchases from some of the Australian products like, like rare earths, for example, that previously it had gotten from China, but could help with the Indian economy and help stabilize the situation within India. So as China does these kind of unconventional asymmetric type attacks up across the region, uh, sort of Indo-Pacific charter adherence, not a military thing, but just a, a collection of people, of nations who are like-minded in how they would like to see the Indo-Pacific develop, could figure out mechanisms for creating more stability, security, and prosperity. Thanks, uh, Rory and Cleo.